And we're going to move right along here to our next talk. Um, and our next talk is going to be Designing for Engagement, the story of the Rebuilding Exchange from Elise Zelikowski. Um, and Elise is a social entrepreneur and activist committed to working on solutions to address today's most pressing social, economic, and environmental issues. Elisa is currently leading a social innovation practice at ThoughtWorks and focusing on the ways technology can be leveraged as a tool for social change. Um, so this is going to be a good one. So I'm going to transfer this over to Elise. Um, and let's see here. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Let me... Uh, Perfect make you presenter here. Okay, we see your video. Great. Do you want to share your screen and we can, I'll let you know if we can see it. Do you see that? Yep, perfect. If you want to make it um, presenter or yeah, we could uh, do that. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this is really exciting. I love this format of being online. Um, I wish I could see you all, but um, I'm really happy that we're doing it this way. Um, so uh, my name is Elise Delikowski, and I'm the um, Head of Social Impact at ThoughtWorks. For those of you who don't know ThoughtWorks, we're a uh, global software consultancy. We have about 6,000 consultants working in uh, about 42 offices in 14 countries. So we have uh, a pretty sort of um, varied geographic footprint. So we're in the business of, of custom software, um, and we do a lot of advisory and organizational transformation. We've been around about 25 years, and um, in about 2010, we um, really wanted to articulate our commitment to social justice, and we employed this sort of new framing of our business model as a three-pillar business model, um, borrowing from um, the inspiration of Ben and Jerry's that uses a similar model. Um, but really what I do at ThoughtWorks is I help um, uh, nonprofit partners sort of understand how they can um, use technology tools to solve different kinds of problems. Uh, and I also help our technologists think about um, how to bring more of an equity, um, inclusivity, um, and ethics lens to the kind of technology or design work that we're doing. Um, and so my background is in um, nonprofit management, policy, um, and um, uh, sort of strategy in that space. But I was really interested in the way technology is being used as a tool um, for social change and also how technology is increasingly uh, creating a gap, right, um, between people who have and know how to use the tools and people who don't. Um, so that's a lot of what my work um, involves at ThoughtWorks. And, um, yeah, happy to be here. Um, so the story I'm going to tell today is, <clears throat> is, a, is about rebuilding exchange. Um, and I called it um, Design for Engagement um, because I really think that the, the vision behind the rebuilding exchange um, and what we set out to create with this project was um, uh, one that is really sort of about um, transformative social innovation, really trying to sort of understand how we could reimagine the waste stream, the whole entire system, and create radical systemic change. And in order to do that, um, we knew that we really had to sort of activate a bunch of different people, actors, stakeholders in the system, um, and understand what motivated them, um, you know, what kinds of incentives we needed to have in place, just different ways we could uh, help sort of disrupt the current system um, so that we could get to um, the, this vision, right, that we had set out to, to achieve. So um, we chose building waste um, as our focus because, um, and I should say building waste from when buildings are torn down, um, so not like, you know, um, the kind of materials you might have left over from a project per se, but we do look at those as well. But the primary materials are ones that come from buildings that are being torn down. Um, and if any of you, you know, live in, in cities where during the, the housing crisis or the, the uh, economic crisis in 2008, 
Um, you saw a lot of buildings and, and, and um, just generally properties that were um, sort of caught up in the foreclosure process that sat vacant for sometimes years. Um, they were trying to sort out all the sort of legality um, and ownership issues. Uh, and these are buildings that um, unfortunately fell into disrepair, flooded, froze. Um, so, you know, we had a really sort of intense um, uptick in the number of, of demolitions um, that were going on in 2008. But as we know, um, you know, if you, you know, are at all sort of keeping an eye on the real estate market, people are just, you know, constantly, um, um, you know, wanting to replace old, older houses, older, older building stock with newer structures. So we have a lot of material coming into the, into the waste stream. Um, and in fact, um, almost half of what ends up in our waste stream is building waste. Um, so it's a very large percentage. But we thought the sort of hypothesis here was that if we handle these materials differently, that we would be able to salvage them and turn what was considered um, a liability into a new economic asset um, and create jobs in the meantime, preserve um, architectural history and have an impact on, uh, on climate. Um, so, we know that landfills are a bad idea. They take up space, they pollute, they're often cited in lower income communities um, and they emit carbon. Um, and in cities like Chicago, we actually um, have a moratorium on any new landfills. Um, and Chicago is where I live. And um, this is becoming increasingly a problem and we're just having to transport uh, waste farther and farther away. Um, this is actually the Fresh Kills landfill on Staten Island, um, which in volume is the same size as the Great Wall of China, uh, and is, uh, it forms the highest geographical point, um, um, 1,500 miles of the eastern seaboard, interesting fact. Um, and in fact, in the last 50 years, we have consumed more resources in, globally than in all of previous history. Um, so with that consumption comes mountains of waste, and if you've been following the Marie Kondo craze, um, you know that people are just, uh, you know, going through their homes and spaces and getting rid of, getting rid of tons of stuff, um, and it's a really sort of interesting, you know, cultural conversation, I think, that's emerging about why we consume, some of the dynamics of that consumption, and so... Um, uh, you know, I've been following that actually in relation to the work that I do um, in community with Rebuilding Exchange, but the housing market and the building, building college is a little bit different. Um, so of the building waste that ends up um, in landfills, 57% um, uh, comes from renovation projects, 28% from demolitions, and 15% from new construction. So, you know, new construction would be like you might have some leftover drywall or, you know, a box of tile that um, you didn't end up using on your project. Um, and about 250,000 homes are demolished in the U.S. each year, which represents about 1.5 uh, million trees um, that were used to build those houses. So it's pretty compelling when you just think about the, the amount of lumber that sort of um, that makes up our infrastructure. Um, so that wood that specifically in the Midwest, the wood um, that we used to build all of our houses came from um, old growth um, in, in the states of uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. And we call this wood old growth or first growth wood. And it's very different than the kind of wood you see on the lumber shelves at your local you know, retailer. Um, it is extremely um, uh, dense grain. It's sturdy. Um, it's a really beautiful material. And woodworkers really enjoy working with it. Um, you just don't, you won't find that anymore um, unless you go to a really sort of high-end specialty lumber yard. So there's all this really great material to work with, but, you know, the way it's being um, taken out of these structures is typically a wrecking ball comes in and smashes up the material, um, and then it's rendered useless or, in some cases, um, it's um, used as landfill cover, um, or it's um, used for waste energy plants, they use wood chips, um, and in some cases they use like wood chips for, for landscaping and forestry. But it's not the highest and best use. And so what we're trying to do, um, what we were trying to do with the Rebuilding Exchange Project is really think about highest and best use, um, which for us is reusing that material in another building or construction project. 
Um, so our, our vision was really a thriving market for um, these deconstructed or reclaimed building materials. So this is sort of a um, visualization of, you know, how the, the marketplace works. Um, but we needed to get the supply side and the demand side working together um, so that we could really sort of get that market stimulated. Uh, so we began identifying people and processes, uh, policies that needed to be activated or disrupted um, and formed and facilitated new connections between different kinds of actors and stakeholders who needed to work together um, to facilitate um, that market activity. Um, so the first thing we did actually to, to really sort of dig in here is we uh, started a, a market study with um, the University of Illinois at Chicago to help us really sort of understand the environmental and economic potential of capturing more of these materials from the waste stream and getting them back into the building and renovation market. And that was really sort of the starting point of saying, this is not just sort of a, a nice idea. This is actually, there's actually a sort of a, a financial um, and economic benefit. Um, we just have to sort of tell a different story um, and work, as I said, with these different actors to sort of educate, engage, and, and activate. Um, so um, the process of deconstruction is basically, um, for the most part, a, a hand process, right? It's a manual process where you take uh, materials out in such a way that they can be reused in that form. Um, and so it's a more costly process, you know, than sending in a wrecking ball, which you can get a house down maybe in a couple days. The deconstruction process does take longer. And um, when a process like this does take longer, it requires more labor, which, you know, if you're trying to get in and out of a job site and you're, you know, racing against the clock on a construction project, which most people are, probably because you've been waiting for your permit in most cities for months and months and months, um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a disincentive for a contractor to, to, to invest in that way, unless they can recoup the cost um, of those materials um, through market resale or some other sort of right economic incentive. So a lot of the work, again, that we had to do was sort of really trying to understand how to map those incentives. Um, how could we stimulate, you know, the supply side and get contractors more engaged, uh, wanting to do this, incentivized to do this, participating? Um, and then on the other side, how could we create demand from uh, customers, architects, interior designers, woodworkers, your homeowner, apartment, apartment uh, renters, to then use those materials on the other side? So, um, we realized that we wanted to take a, a systems-based approach to this work. And um, all of those different personas that I mentioned, we had to come up with, with a strategy to, to interact with them and, and engage them. And so a lot of the work that was done in the first year or two of this project was, was that mapping. It was that sort of thinking about um, um, what are sort of examples of how different uh, models uh, in other cities might work to sort of leverage and use as a, as a source of inspiration for what we might do in Chicago. And so we formed a lot of um, uh, advisory groups and networking groups and, and, you know, really sort of mapped that space out. And actually that is where the Rebuilding Exchange was conceived. Um, it was through the bringing together of so many different um, and diverse stakeholders to say, what are the sort of barriers for you in your work um, to supporting a market for the deconstruction and salvage of these materials? And we took that information and worked with them to basically help us design the Rebuilding Exchange. Um, and we knew that the Rebuilding Exchange needed to be a nonprofit organization um, because of the incentive structure uh, that we identified, uh, which was that the donation of materials is a really important part of how to motivate people to participate in this marketplace. Um, that, you know, we had to sort of think through um, uh, a creative way to sort of say, um, not only is this the right thing to do from a, from a climate and environmental perspective, but there's this financial incentive as well. Um, so um, the Rebuilding Exchange is, is a social enterprise. It's based in Chicago. 
Um, we sort of see ourselves as a platform for uh, the exchange of goods, creative ideas, and really promoting a culture of resourcefulness. Um, so a lot of what we try to do with the platform is, um, is inspire um, and sort of demonstrate possibility. Um, so it's, you know, it's a place where you can go in and, and see things being remade into other things, or you can take a workshop, you know, or you, you know, will read about a, a case study of somebody who used materials from our warehouse and something else. Um, so we see sort of education, um, outreach, inspiration as such an important part of, of the work that we, that we do. Um, so a lot of the material that we get in our warehouse is, uh, is lumber. So that is, you know, when you look at a sort of a, your typical single family home, that is primarily what you're going to find. Um, it makes up the, the floorboards, the infrastructure, the beams. Um, and as I said, this material is uh, material that you just won't find anymore um, on, on, on retail, you know, lumber shelves. And so we do a really sort of focused, job to make sure that we're um, handling the material really carefully and then we're telling the story about why this material is so important um, so when people come in there's a lot of um, interpretation that happens um, and we, we and also not just interpretation of you know where the material comes from and the sort of you know it's a, you know, an old growth forest in northern michigan but that this material came out of a house in this neighborhood, this, this house is this many years old. Um, and so it really also personalizes and, and, and gives the material um, a life of its own. And I think we found that that really connects with people um, as people look for stories, right? Um, and they want to be able to feel like um, this material has a story that they can connect with and tell. Um, Another big um, uh, part of our uh, program is, um, is the workshops and training program. So people can come in and actually make tables, benches. Uh, we have a whole host of things that, that, um, that, that they can engage with. And this is really an opportunity for them to feel empowered and, uh, and want to sort of play with different kinds of materials. And what's been really awesome is we're 10 years old now. We're just celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. Uh, and um, our shop has been primarily run by women. Um, and we, that is sort of a really different kind of environment. And we've been able to really create a space where um, people who don't identify um, or who, who identify as female um, uh, feel comfortable and, um, and really want to be. And um, that's been a really important part of our program. Uh, that we've been running for so long. Um, the other program that we run um, out of the out of the enterprise is a job training program for people who have been involved primarily with the criminal justice system in some way. So uh, to date, we've done about um, uh, four or five different cohorts um, and had about 120 or so people go through the program. And typically, um, and most recently, the program lasts about six months, and they get all different types of training in the warehouse. They get an opportunity to work on the retail floor, um, in the wood shop. Um, they're interacting with customers. Um, and then we work with an agency um, to place them into, into jobs, sometimes in the field, sometimes um, in a related field. And this has really been a core part of our program since we opened our doors. Because when we think about it, like transformative social innovation, taking a systems approach, you know, you have to sort of activate not only the marketplace um, at a high level, right, sort of thinking about supply, thinking about demand, but you have to sort of make sure that there are um, policies in place that sort of support the growth of the market and that there are people trained, um, not only the contractors, but um, people who are out there doing the, the physical deconstruction um, merchandising the materials, selling the materials, refurbishing the materials. And so that's a really important um, part of, of the work. Um, in fact, on the subject of job creation, uh, the reef and recycling industry creates seven jobs for every one job in the landfilling industry. So as I talked about earlier, the construction process takes a lot longer, um, but the job creation potential is, is amazing. And some cities, including Chicago, do have deconstruction and salvage ordinances. 
um, cities like Seattle, for example. Um, in Chicago, we do have a certain percentage that contractors have to divert from the landfills as well. So it's 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 starting to catch on more as, as people sort of start to see the the bigger picture of what the the possibility is now that the markets are starting to emerge. Um, the last program is RX Made, and this is our furniture line. Uh, we've had a lot of fun sort of playing with different kinds of products and. Um, responding to the market and seeing what people are really excited about. So we generate everything from custom builds like this community parklet to um, a whole product line, which is the bottle opener you see um, on the slides, and office furniture. A lot of people have um, uh, in the architecture design um, industry have, have come to us saying, you know, we really want um, more of our office furniture to be made from salvage materials, and we really want to play with that idea um, throughout the office design process. Um, so that's been that's been a really great way to connect with people um, because the aesthetic um, of reuse um, is is still really popular. Um, so you know we 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 created all these different programs um, for rebuilding exchange to provide so many multiple ways to engage um, for the purposes of activating a very diverse group of people. And um, we've made, I think, a significant amount of impact in 10 years. Um, these are some of our, our stats. Um, over a million pounds of building materials diverted from the landfill each year. Uh, 28,000 pounds of lumber diverted from landfills through just the RX made um, product line each year. We do about 300 workshops. And we have about a thousand people who come through our doors um, every year. Um, and lastly, we take a lot of pride in, in the, the training program having really good results. Um, and that's not only you know because of our program, but because of our partners who are really committed to making sure that people who go through the program um, uh, end up in, in roles that um, that are sustainable and make sense for them. So. I'll stop here, uh, but I'm really looking forward to connecting with anyone offline who wants to talk more about it, who's got a similar project going on in your city, um, or just want to brainstorm. So thank you so much.